to discuss the innovation ecosystem, please welcome our first panel of the day, Dr. Scott Koenig, President and CEO of Macrogenics, Lisa Lacasse, President of American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, Dr. Elias Zerhouni, President Emeritus at John Hopkins University, and Dr. Rena Conti, Professor at Boston University. Joining them is The Hill's Editor-at-Large, Steve Clemens. Jumped in front of you. Sorry about that. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. Elias, I think we uh, uh, gave you a different, a different job. I just want to say he's, he's sort of the Wizard of Oz guy here. He was former director of the NIH, so he knows all. Uh, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. Um, thank you all. I mean, our job in this session that we have is to talk about the innovation ecosystem. And Scott, I want to start with you. And I want to tell everyone he has changed his schedule uh, immensely to be here today. And he's got to catch a flight. He's leaving at 10.15, so he has permission. Uh, uh, and, and I want to thank you. So I want to start with you and just w without going into, into too much promotional detail about your company, but I'd love to know how your company is a manifestation, if you will, of the, of the innovation ecosystem um, and, and, and what we should be thoughtful about as we think about that today. Oh, thank you for that question. You know, we started the company 19 years ago with this um, vision to develop sort of the next generation of immune-based therapeutics to treat a whole host of diseases. Currently, we're focusing on the development of treatments for cancer. And so as we started out the company, this was a concept company without any actual intellectual property um, at, at hand or actual um, uh, targeted molecules. So we had to develop that technology from the get-go. We had to develop the infrastructure for that company from everything from early um, preclinical discovery. Today we're a fully integrated company that goes, takes preclinical molecules, does, develops them um, in, in animal model systems, goes into uh, testing in, in patients, and have all the regulatory infrastructure. And in fact, we have commercial manufacturing um, facilities that we built in-house. This is a very unusual, full-fledged company, and yet now the company is 19 years old, and we still have not had a approved product on the market. And this is not atypical uh, for the, this um, kind of uh, organization. So what's the Petri dish that you cooked this in? <laughs> in, in other words, what were the elements um, you know, from, from science or NIH or university? I mean, what were the elements that you needed to be successful? Well, basically, it's, it's great ideas, great science, great personnel that can t sort of take those ideas and bring it to a practical solution. So we had to go, you know, again, uh, t take these ideas that we, we believed in, in terms of immune therapeutics, and take those principles now and apply to identifying a, the core technology that we wanted to develop, the targets that we wanted to go after, the molecules we wanted to, uh, to develop. And once we started that process, it took this long a period of time to now, recently we had a successful phase three trial for a very uh, uh, new uh, molecule for treatment of breast cancer, which we think will bring, uh, obviously, uh, benefits um, to women and, and certainly a, a subset of men um, that have no treatments approved for, for this molecule. We've also been testing this quite much more broadly in treatment of gastric cancer and other cancers. Now, when we started the company 19 years ago, the idea that an immune-based therapeutic would become a mainstay of, of treatment for cancer was a crazy notion. I mean, in fact, we had a lot of problems trying to raise the capital initially. So but, people thought you were a nut job. Well, <laughs> in a way, it's just saying that you know we had this belief, we we understood the science here, but as as we've learned, for any new technology or no uh, or new science, it takes actually decades to develop that technology to ultimately develop approved products. So, for a good good example, the idea of antibody therapeutics is now a mainstay of treatment across all different um, therapeutic areas. The first discovery of monoclonal antibody occurred in 1976. It took a decade to 1986 to get the first approved treatment for transplantation of an antibody, and then another decade to get the first major treatments for treatment of cancer and autoimmune disease. So basically, two decades to take a technology that was discovered to get it now to uh, products in the market. The same thing is true for now, which we're talking about gene therapy. The first gene therapy uh, treatments started in the early 1990s, and we only had the first a 
approved gene therapy product within the last two years. So again, it's about a decade, decade and a half to go take a concept to implement that technology and then ultimately develop products. So you need a lot of capital to do this. In the, in the short history of my company, from the time we started the company, the cost, if you take in all the costs of all the failures, um, basically 90% it, it, of molecules that actually make it into phase one clinical development will, will ultimately fail. So, you know, if you had that batting average in the, in the major leagues, you'd be set down to the minors because you could never survive on, 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 that, on that success right. rate. And, and ultimately, what happens is, is that the cost for these things yeah. currently has gone from back when we started at about a $1.2 billion, now it's costing $2.6 billion to take a molecule from early stage all the way through approval. So a lot of capital required, and therefore we have to provide the incentives um, to be able to support the industry. Thank you. Rena, let's talk about the brains required. And you're at Boston University, and you're, you know, we were talking uh, on the phone the other day that I was sort of obsessed at one point with the, what was called the Bayh-Dole Act. Uh, and how that changed the game on intellectual property right and, uh, you know, uh, creating uh, new incentives. To, and you saw an explosion, if you will, after that from universities and private sector investment uh, in, in new therapies across the board. And so I'm, I'm just, so I'm, I'm wondering, is, is Bayh-Dole enough? Are we doing enough from, from a university and academic perspective when it looks at the research and innovation base? Sure. Thank you for the question and thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm an economist by training, and the vast majority of my work is on incentives for innovation and what we do after they are priced. Um, the bottom line is that we have very significant and very robust incentives for innovation in the United States. We have a very permissive pricing policies, and in addition, we have additional incentives that underwrite the cost of production um, for innovative companies like my colleagues and many others out there. Hmm. And is there anything you would tweak? I mean, here's a chance to just, you're in Washington, you know, <laughs> call out the villains. So um, the main issue is that we live in the richest country in the world, in, in, uh, and we are the richest country in the history of the world. And yet we have essentially a tale of two Americas now that is emerging, where we have people who are very well insured, and when they are eligible for therapy, they can access it and they can afford it. And we have people who are very underinsured and who when they are indicated for access to a certain therapy, they simply cannot afford it or their payer refuses to pay. And so if there is anything that I would say we need to fix here, it's the financing of access to therapies that are truly going to transform people's lives. Elias, thank you. Let me talk about, um, I mean, talk about whatever you like, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the role of NIH. Um, and, and the NIH is the sort of, this, this kingdom of science, of government-supported science. You also work uh, with industry and, and, and groups like Scott and others. But is it healthy today? Is it what it should be? So when you look at, first of all, let me say something about the Bayh-Dole Act. It has been a revolutionary act. It changed the, uh, the makeup of innovation in the US and is being copied around the world. When I was the NIH director, I would travel around the world. The two things people would ask me was, where, uh, how, do you, how does your peer review system work? Uh, because we do have a system that distributes according to the merit of the proposal. And you can criticize it all you want, but every other country wants the same. And then the, same, the second thing was the Bayh-Dole Act. Well, how did the Bayh-Dole Act change things? It's really important to say that before the Bayh-Dole Act, basic research, translational research, applied research were done in these vertical uh, uh, pharma-like research labs, you know, with people in one building doing all the research needed to create a drug. Right. And that was the way Bell Labs worked, IBM Labs worked, GE Labs worked. And everything was done within companies with really mm. stifled innovation, frankly. What happened after the Bayh-Dole Act is freedom came. Mm. So the research universities became productive, they could keep their license, and then they started to create biotech companies. You wouldn't be here without the Bayh-Dole Act, frankly, because Absolutely. you wouldn't have gotten the technology of the research that was done. Now, when you look at basic research, 
NIH is the absolute source of all of that mm. basic research. But the basic research obviously is only 10, 15 percent of the total value because you have to then do the translational. And, and so from my point of view, what is absolutely essential is to understand that in biology, what we know is insufficient to be predictive of success. Mm. That's why we have a 90 percent failure rate. And so if I had one message is we need to continue our lead in basic research. You know, everything else will take care of itself. If you know how, a, how Alzheimer's disease occurs or, or what is the mechanism for this disease or that disease, I can trust me, I think the innovation that we have, uh, a system that we have is strong enough to actually permit the development of solutions. Now, it takes 22 years or 19 years in your case. It's long. So you have to have a long-term view. If you ask me, how is the NIH doing? NIH is doing, is doing as good, as, as well as it could in the context of a very complex biology and healthcare system. However, the one thing I would say needs to be done right now is to have more of a long-term view for NIH investments in research and in other categories. And, and balance, if you will, the short-term and the long-term better because companies cannot sustain in the future if prices come down, they cannot live for 20, 19 years or 20 years if we do the innovation, a, 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 if we change the reward system for the innovation. But let me finish with one thing. It is important to realize that innovation in biotech is time limited. When you create an innovation, you don't have 100 years like Disney products or movies that have 90-year copyrights. You have 10, 15 years to recover your investment. And what happens after that? You gift it to the world. Right. I mean, today, statins cost pennies because the companies that had the, the patents lost them and basically gifted this to, to the world. So time limited, basic science dependent, very, very important to have the Biodol ecosystem encouraged and continue to have collaborations across fields and countries as well. I want to jump in, in a second to, to Lisa to see what we're getting right and wrong when it comes to sort of advancement. Don't, don't give it away yet, Elias. <laughs> on this broad question, I mean, you, you make a big case about Bidol and about uh, long term. I've interviewed Francis Collins, your successor, um, a few times on this and said, you know, we, we still play short term games with budgets and if that sends shock waves through the R&D base uh, uh, and, and creates instability where, where stability would Stability of funding lines would be a very different case. But I guess I'm interested in what the other guys are doing because part of what, of the global technology base today also includes places like China and India uh, uh, and other players that are out there invest. The Russians are, are investing heavily. And, and, um, and this just isn't about health science. If you look at science, and you know, I, was, I was writing uh, just a piece a month ago about the president's budget and the National Science Foundation separate from NIH. And NSF, they came in with a billion dollar cut uh, in, in, in what they were proposing for the budget. And I'm, and I'm you know, just sitting here fl kind of flabbergasted in terms of what Ooh. seems to be diminishing value or di a diminishing sense of value of investment in those basic government functions of R&D, which then feed into the university sector, which somehow then uh, feed into the ecosystem. What is China doing? I mean, you've spent a lot of time dealing with China. And is China <laughs> doing it better than us? Oh, well, they're doing it faster than us for sure right now. I mean, their rate of growth is four times our rate of growth. Already by 2018, in purchasing power, their research investment is equal to the U.S. Right. And is going to keep growing. That's one. The second is that they do plan long term, just like Europe. They have seven-year visions for their strategy. They already published the 2025 plans, you can, it's public, you know it, you, you know, and it's going to go that way. Europe has the same system. They have what they call the, the framework program for research around Europe, which is, has a seven-year window. And you can see these investments that are done that we could not do. Mm. And I'm encouraging that. I was encouraging that at the NIH. Francis continues to do that, where we have public-private partnerships around real problems like Alzheimer's disease and others. But what's, di what's different? is the intensity and the willpower to really invest the, um, the, the, the necessary amounts and, and also try to really capture intellectual capital. Scott, did you think, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to make a comment about China. Uh, I've been following the changes that have gone on there over the last uh, five, six years. Uh, um, as part of BIO, we've been uh, going almost annually to uh, 
um, work with the um, government officials and the, the FDA there um, to, to actually help them to teach them um, what we do and to do it better because ultimately everybody ultimately benefits if we have a common system across the world where drugs are tested similarly. And so there was a real transformation in the past year and a half in China. They accepted what are so-called ICH guidelines. These are uh, harmonization guidelines that are standards across the world and the industry and, and uh, all the regulatory agencies. And that was a huge change on the perception of can you deal with Chinese companies and Chinese science and they've, um, as um, Dr. Zuhuni pointed out, um, as part of their five-year plan, biotechnology is one of the major pillars of their investment as a, as a country. And so if that has gotten the priority there, I could tell you two years ago when we were there, I was really frightened that we, you know, we as an industry, the biotech industry, were gonna suffer long-term and China was gonna dominate. I have a little more renewed hope given that at least the public markets have responded. There's been more venture investments um, in, in, the, in, the, um, um, in new companies and, and the IPO market is going well. But if we don't sustain this, China's not going to you know, uh, wait for us. Um, they're going to go uh, pass us by. So we'll have to take your temperature every year on China. I need to, I need to quickly move to um, uh, Lisa for a quick, and then we'll come back. But Lisa, on, on, you know, as I look at these different pieces here on stage, you know, universities, research companies, and, and, and then essentially, I don't know what they call the American Health Society, you know, clients, but, you know, people are out there, you know, real people. Our patients. You know, essentially, yeah, and, and, and how this is coming. When you look at the cancer picture, some parts of it are wonderful. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the changes that have happened in you know, li literally the last you know, decade and, and even more recently. And I'm wondering, you know, as you handicap what you care about in terms of the work you do with the American Cancer Society, what is going well in this ecosystem from your perspective, but more importantly, what is not going well? What are our blind spots? Well, certainly the innovation is huge. And the most important thing, though, is that innovation reaches patients and it reaches patients in an equitable way. We all know there's unequal burden of disease. That is particularly true for cancer. As these um, incredible new discoveries come to light and they're more personalized, mm. um, that's a more sophisticated healthcare system, right. which may actually feed into making disparities even wider. So the, the, the things that we- And the they thing, are getting wider now, right? They, yeah, it, it depends. I mean, one of the, we're starting to see some really great research actually coming out of the American Cancer Society where states that have expanded Medicaid are actually seeing higher screening rates. This feeds right into prevention issues. So th there's no question it is an ecosystem, right? right? You sort of the proverbial balloon. You squeeze sure. one place, it comes out someplace else. Um, what's really, really important, though, from a patient perspective, one is that the patients stay in the center of this entire discussion. The whole point of this right. is for patients. Um, and secondly, that access to care is the most critical success factor to a person's ability to fight any disease, certainly cancer. Um, the, you know, the evidence shows that writ large. And so we have to have a system in the United States where people are well insured and that therefore, and that coverage is affordable to them. And we can talk a lot about affordability. For us, it's about a patient lens. So mm. what is your out-of-pocket costs? And are you being able to access based upon your insurance coverage not where you live, preferably, which is often what happens now. Mm -hmm. uh, depending upon what state you are, your coverage may be very different. Um, so that, you know, access to care for us is the most important thing. And we really don't think it's an either or as it relates to innovation and affordability and access. It cannot be an either or. People have to rely on these um, new discoveries and that requires investment. Before I jump back to Rena, because I, 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 want, I want her to have a chance to talk about China as well, but on this, on this question, um, I really just think there are literacy challenges out there in health, right? I, I, and you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I just go around the country and the literacy that the regular people have, it sort of seems like people have defected to some degree, a, a kind of responsibility of knowing more so that they're subject to whatever 
uh, winds and forces may be coming, you know, of, of the things in this room. What can we do from your perspective to change that? Yeah, I, it's a really good point, and it was brought up by one of the senators just before. I think that there's a literacy level, both for clinicians as well as patients, and we have to invest in people understanding why insurance coverage is important, why, what treatments are available to them. So there are inter, I think there are education interventions that need to happen, but I think mm -hmm. they have to be really deliberate, and we have to invest in them. Thank you. Rima? Whoops. I know you're going to also address the China issue. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I completely agree with you. I think price transparency on exactly what is available and how much is it actually going to benefit you to take these products every single day is incredibly important. And that, that type of price transparency on drugs should be matched by the tr price transparency that we see throughout other parts of our system. Mm. Um, so that's clear, and it's it's actually in the executive order, an increase in So you're positive about where we're going now on that front? Absolutely. It's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. We can't shop. We can't make decisions. We can't have real informed conversations with our physicians if we don't actually know what the costs are, what the benefits are, and what the trade-offs are. Um, secondly, on China, not only is it incredibly important that we have a strong position on intellectual property, on being in the room, um, investing in new technology, but we also need to have a strong position on manufacturing. And that needs to be domestic manufacturing for a lot of the products that, again, we um, take every single day. There have been quality issues. There have been shortages for drugs that are coming from overseas. That is something that we can make some progress on. Thank you. Can I make one comment? You can. Uh, so Bates, that's and somebody who wants to ask questions, just wink at me. Yeah, so just uh, on the manufacturing issue, they actually changed the rules in China before companies were unable to develop uh, drugs in phase one and early testing unless the drug was manufactured in China. They changed those rules again 18 months ago, which is allowing us, for instance, to partner with Chinese companies because we provide actually the drug for testing in China as well as in the U.S. Do you so, have do you have fear of them stealing your intellectual property? We, there is a, a absolute concern about IP protection, but what we're also seeing is is that the infrastructure in China they have they want to to actually support their innovative research, so they have to pr protect their innovative research as well. So we're moving in the right direction, but it can't we can't. You know, keep a, we have to keep our eye on that and keep that going. Let's get one question right here. So, Nikio, I'm a physician at Georgetown and uh, uh, also run a software company. And I'm heartened to hear of the general optimism about uh, innovation in curative care or developing treatments. One thing I haven't heard either earlier this morning or from this panel is the concept of innovation in prevention, mm. which I think is particularly important since the United States is now approaching a 40% obesity level a largely preventable condition, and sure. I think within just a few years, more Americans will be obese than not. Anything to say about innovation in prevention? I will just start. Um, clearly, literacy about health and about what is a, 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 a good, you know, good nutrition, good good behavior, healthy behavior. So it's number one. So it has to do with basic education as well. And the second is the social deter social determinants of health are very important. There are disparities in our country that actually drive these statistics. Um, I mean, healthcare in Mississippi is very different than healthcare in Minnesota, but we try to have a one-size-fits-all solution. So I really believe that the, um, the prevention issues, the what I call embedded health, where you can really change the health status of the population are really underrepresented, and we need to make a lot more uh, efforts because our system is really driven to acute care. Not preventive care, not even chronic care. On the innovation front, I think probably the, the future is um, diagnostics and being able to get biomarkers that we detect very early. Um, a good example in the cancer field, for instance, is we have a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer. I mean, that took years to identify the pathogen, um, obviously um, immunize, and then obviously follow those patients for prevention. The same tools that we're using now for late-stage disease, as we applied early, many of these uh, therapeutics can be used earlier for, for better outcomes mm -hmm. and obviously uh, better health. Lisa, do you have something yet? Yeah, I mean, this, nearly 50% of cancers that are diagnosed are uh, preventable. 
So I. It's want, that high. It's that high. Fifty percent. Fifty percent. And so, and I want to uh, echo what Dr. Zahuni just said: is that the more people understand and are educated about screening, healthy weight, uh, all the things that are related to their ability to live in a healthy way, uh, the more uptake we'll have. I mean, our, our screening rates are right. so varied, it goes to this issue of Rena, depending upon Rena? where you live. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, not only do we need literacy, but we also need money and a willingness, particularly among the states who are frankly bearing the burden of, um, of very significant health and health disparities um, to invest. The states are also a laboratory for experimentation. The state of Louisiana, a very poor state, and a state that, signi that significantly suffers from, from health burden, right. um, is investing in prevention for hepatitis C and really trying to push the availability of cures for that disease. That is a model for other states to follow. If right. Louisiana can do it, other states with much more resources can Elias do it Elias Quigzinger, real, real fast. Um, I just want to say that the system sometimes plays against health. I mean, I, I remember when I was asked, you know, what are we doing, going to do about obesity? Well, you know, in tobacco, we tax tobacco and it reduces the use of tobacco. And we just heard Senator mention saying, well, let's tax uh, OxyContin to be able to treat. And then when I proposed that to one of my appropriators, who was from a farm state, where they get a lot of subsidy for corn syrup and mm, a lot right. of very processed foods, which we know scientifically are not the way to feed the population, then the response is, don't touch that. Don't touch that, please. So politics has a lot to do, and the structure of a healthcare reimbursement system and the economics of it have a lot to do with your question. So we're right at the end. I just want to say, Joel, thanks for your question. And, and you know, I'm gonna, since I'm chair, um, uh, my editorial comment is I'm fascinated by bank shots in this question that there aren't necessarily silver bullets to solve everything. But Mick Cornett, my friend who was former mayor of Oklahoma City, um, was appearing on the front of Fast Company and all these things as Oklahoma City, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. But they were also getting labeled as one of the most obese cities in the country when he was there. And so, and including he himself personally. Uh, and so they somehow managed to get 40,000 people collectively online across race, across socioeconomic groups within the greater Oklahoma City to collectively lose a million pounds of weight. Now, that may sound like a fad or something that may disappear, but I'm interested in the fact that maybe sometimes we need to not just have health people up here, but marketing people or people thinking about, you know, gaming or other dimensions that we just aren't including. So I just want to, that's on us. We should broaden it, but I wouldn't say it's just in one, in one area when you kind of look at a community. I want to thank Rena Conti at Boston University, Scott Koenig of Macrogenics. Thank you very much, Elias. Uh, uh, um, uh, Zarhuni, former director of the National Institutes of Health and Lisa Lacasse of Cancer of the American Cancer Society. Thank you all so much. Fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and your, our panelists for the insightful conversation and for your time today. Now for a word from our sponsor. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Jim Greenwood, President and CEO of Biotechnology Innovation Organization, and Rosemary Calibro Tully, Director of the Alliance to Protect Medical Innovation. All right, well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Rosemary Calibro Tully. I'm with the Alliance to Protect Medical Innovation. We're a nonpartisan organization focused on fostering fact based and holistic dialogues on medical innovation and access to patient care. And I'm honored to be here today with um, Congressman Jim Greenwood, uh, former congressman from the 8th District of Pennsylvania and the current president and CEO of BIO. So thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you all for being here. Um, as the leader of an organization that represents more than 1,000 biotechnology companies, academic institutions, and other organizations, how healthy is the innovation ecosystem here in the United States, and what do we need to do to sustain it? Well, the ecosystem is uh, healthier here than it is anywhere else in the world, and is healthier here than it has ever been in the world. Our scientists and our entrepreneurs and our investors are doing a remarkable job. We're into a new era of gene therapy, cell therapy, immunotherapy, CRISPR, gene editing, uh, and we have record numbers of drugs being approved. Uh, we have record numbers of drugs in the pipeline, 7,000 of them right now. 
Uh, we're getting record numbers of investments in small and emerging biotech companies by the venture capitalists, about $12 billion, I think, last year. Uh, last year, something like $5 billion uh, invested in IPOs for startup companies going public. So that is all doing swimmingly well, yeah. uh, and there's never been more hope for patients than there is right now. So it sounds like we're on the cusp of uh, a medical innovation, the golden age of medicine. What could impede that progress? Uh, bad policy. Um, in fact, that's really the only thing that will impede progress. There's nothing's going to stop the science. Um, we have the best entrepreneurs in the world. We have a culture where our entrepreneurs are willing to um, f try and fail and get up and try and fail, which is not a universal cultural quality around the planet. Um, and we have investors who are savvy and are used to investing in uh, the life sciences and know how to do their homework and know how to uh, make the right choices. So all of that is pretty much unstoppable except for bad policy. What might drive bad policy? As we've heard for a very no good number of years now, there is a problem with, with all of the, this, and that is that not everyone in the United States, let alone the world, can affordably access these products. That's a problem. It's a real problem. We innovate 60% of all the drugs in the world, and many of the drugs that are innovated in Asia and in Europe are innovated for our system. And the reason that is is because we're the only place left in the world um, of any significance that has a market-based system. And that means that when these investors invest in these startup companies and in the one out of ten times that they succeed and they get their appro product approved by the FDA, they can set a price of a reimbursement that is acceptable to the market. And that means that they can recoup their investment and go and invest in the next drug. The reason that the drugs can be expensive when they start out before they go generic is because 90% failure rates and the basic economics are high risk, high reward. Now, if you're well insured and you don't have a high deductible, you're in pretty good shape. But many people do have high deductibles. In fact, half of the people who receive their health insurance from the private from private employers are now have high deductible plans. So if you have a $10,000 drug, and a $3,000 deductible, you have yourself a $3,000 problem, and that's a big problem for almost everyone. You could do anything you want to get the price of that drug down to in half, $5,000. If you still have a $3,000 deductible, you have a problem. And so we can't, the drug manufacturers and innovators can't price our way out of that problem. Part of the solution has to be how are we constructing our insurance programs, private and public, to make sure that we protect the patients from unaffordable out-of-pocket costs. The Medicare Part D program, which I was very proud to be a, a, a big supporter of and a program I worked hard on back in 2003, was set up, unfortunately, in order to, to um, alleviate the concerns of the most fiscally conservative to have patient skin in the game. So you have a $430 deductible, and that patient now pays 25% in the initial coverage area, 25% in the donut hole, 5% in the catastrophic. So of the 45 med million med Medicare Part D beneficiaries, about a million of them pay more than $3,000 a year out of pocket, many five, seven, 10, 12, and $15,000. And all of them essentially are at risk of that happening to them. All they have to do is get sick and need a, an expensive drug. Um, I think that's immoral. I think it's an ethical issue. And I think it's up to Congress to solve that issue. Congress needs to put a cap on that out-of-pocket expense. Something like $200 a month would be reasonable. And that would take this problem off the table for those 45 million and growing numbers of people. Cynics, or not, excuse me, people who are question um, that notion say, well, who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be the taxpayers or the, or the patients? I think the drug industry and the insurance industry and the Congress all need to get, all of the stakeholders need to get around the table and say, how do we afford this kind of a cap? Because it's not an extraordinarily high number, and it's a critical, and as I said, a moral and ethical issue that we need to solve. As a former member of Congress, you know, right now there's a lot of policy proposals moving through Capitol Hill. What do you think is the most important priority from a policy perspective? Well, I think the most important priority is the one I just uh, addressed. Now, if you look at some of the other proposals, um, the, th the number one issue that seems a proposal that seems to be coming out of the, of the House is the notion that we take the Medicare Part D program and we give the Secretary of Health and Human Services the authority to negotiate prices in the program. And then if uh, for the top either 25 or 250, whatever they settle on, most expensive drugs, if the manufacturer doesn't, innovator doesn't agree to the price offered by HHS, then it goes to binding arbitration. 
Um, number one, by all of the drugs are all the prices are all ready negotiated in the Part D program by the private insurers. That's always been the case. It's a fallacy that these prices are not negotiated. Number two, um, no one will invest in all of these spectacular new technologies if they know that in the unlikely chance that they succeed and get that one in 10 to the FDA and get it approved and go to launch it, that they will immediately be subject to binding arbitration for reimbursement. Investment in, in all of these gene therapies, cell therapies, immunotherapies goes down the tubes because, uh, because we won't uh, incentivize the investment in it anymore. And even if it were to succeed, and even if, if most of the proposals that you see before Congress and coming out of the administration were to succeed and get prices down 10%, 15%, 20%, somewhere where it wouldn't completely destroy innovation, you're not doing that much for the patient because if they still have these huge out-of-pocket deductibles, then they still can't get access to the medicine. As you know, tonight kicks off the first debate among the Democratic presidential hopefuls. What would you like them to consider as they start to build out their policy platforms on health care? Well, if I had all 20, whatever there are of them now, <laughs> in front of me, and, and I was uh, asked, which I would never be, but if I were to ask to give them a little advice on to how to address the, the issue of, of drug affordability, what I would say to them is, if you go on the debate floor, if you go out in the hustings, and if you think that the way to address this is to see how um, many applause lines you can get by bashing the drug innovators, shame on you, you're not worthy of the job. These companies are filled with scientists who just want to do the right thing, and bashing them is very, very counterproductive to the hopes of the patients. But if you want to go out there and say, let's figure out how to really solve the patient's problem without destroying um, the, 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 the industry in which we lead the world and in which thousands and millions of patients around the globe are counting on to deliver new innovations, then be productive about it. Be, a, be one who, who brings people together and solves the problem. The other thing I would say for those who are advocating for Medicare for all or some other version of a single payer system, I personally think that we are, and it, it, is, it is again unethical that we still have tens of millions of people who are uninsured. We need universal coverage, and that needs to be done in a sensible way. And as others, the senators have said, it can be done if we actually get the politics out of it. Um, but I would also say, if you, if you believe in a single-payer system, then you have the obligation to say, answer the question, how will that single-payer system be sufficiently funded to continue to incentivize investment in these technologies? Because if, if not, if you create a single-payer system that restricts access it restricts reimbursement to the point that it, it drives the investors away, then all of the hope that all of these millions of patients have in these new wonderful technologies would go down the drain, and that would be the crime of the century. Well, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We still have 40 seconds left. <laughs>